the urban mobility is and what are they, their projects and proposals. Uh, after that, Carnet is going to present the project and also uh, the team, the consortium that um, that um, works on Furnish. Then the city of Milan uh, is going to um, to explain a bit what are the challenges that cities are 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 well are take, tackling now with uh, COVID nineteen and uh, in public space. Uh, the UPC is going to talk about uh, urban policies also in this in this situation. Elizabeth is going to present the design approach generator and the, the concept of temporality in public space. And IAC is going to, to present to talk about digital fabrication. Uh, I am going to present every person who is going to talk. First of all, we have uh, EIT Urban Mobility. With us, it's it's Cel Obregón, and she's going to to present uh, and to talk to us about uh, the the EIT. It's Cel. So, yes, thank you very much Ines, for the introduction. So good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, introductory session for this uh, open call that's uh, coming from the Furnish project and uh, about this. Uh, I understand digitally fabricated urban elements that are going to be adapting these public spaces in the face of the COVID challenge. Uh, yeah, as uh, Ines uh, said, uh, my name is Itzel Obregón and I am innovation manager here at the EIT Urban Mobility. I'm working at the central hub based in Munich. And yeah, I'm gonna give a, a bit of a introduction of what EIT does and what was um, the call, uh, the COVID call about, and uh, this is what is uh, Furnish uh, part of. So the EIT, Urban Mobility, is an initiative of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. And uh, uh, the idea of EIT, Urban Mobility, is to engage people, connect community, accelerate market opportunities, and also reimagine public spaces. So as you see, it's uh, very much aligned to what Furnish uh, is uh, aiming as well. So that's perfect. Um, we want to make an innovation community that educates and inspires mobility solutions for this uh, century, um, the cities that we want to create that are more people oriented. Um, the initiative was uh, started last year and since then, we've been encouraging like positive changes in the way people move around cities uh, in order to make uh, like the overall goal is to make more livable places. So um, EIT Urban Mobility is aiming to become the largest European initiative transforming urban mobility. And for that, we have uh, co-funding up to 400 uh, million over the next six years from the EIT, which is this... Uh, body of the European Union. Um, so yeah, we uh, change to the next slide, please. Or can I change myself? Ah, yes. <laughs> so yeah, so we, we engage uh, and then the, the bottom line of everything we do are city uh, urban challenges. So what is exactly the problem in cities when it comes to mobility, and this is what we care about the most. Uh, uh, after that, we connect with the key players and encourage them to co-create together, to so make projects that are having partnerships such as Furnish with, together with cities, universities, and private uh, companies and so on. Um, so we accelerate this uh, competi competitiveness of, um, of the industry uh, business ideas and innovation. So we want also not only that it, uh, it it stays as a research project, but we want it to become also market opportunities and new business models and players. And finally, we also want to educate to close the knowledge gap uh, by bringing students and professionals and uh, universities into the program. Um, so Furnish, as I mentioned, it's being co-financed by the EIT Urban Mobility as part of the uh, COVID crisis response project. So this was an exceptional call to address the COVID outbreak. And the goal was to make a rapid implementation of solutions that 
are lasting mainly from July to December, so six months, uh, that would generate immediately or short-term impact within the urban mobility area. Uh, we had quite some interesting proposals. We selected 11, and one of them was Furnish, and they have demos in 10 cities, for example, Barcelona, Milan, Bergamo, Istanbul, Copenhagen, Budapest, Bilbao, and so on. And the areas that were um, targeted were hygiene, recovery of shared mobility, and how to move and distance, as well as such as furnish, so the repurposing of public space. And finally, we also had some projects that uh, targeted vulnerable people. Um, I don't know if um, you have any more questions, you can address them to me separately or here. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, please check out our website for next opportunities. Thank you very much, Itzel. Uh, after, at the end of the, of the presentation, we are going to have a questions and answers uh, moment. Then if you have specific questions for Itzel, you can, you can do it. Now uh, it's time to talk to Carnet. Uh, Angelica Caicedo is going to, to present uh, the, the, an overview of the Furnish project and also who the consortium uh, is. Angelica? Thank you, Ness. Uh, hi, uh, thank you all for joining us in this uh, session. Well, I'm going to introduce a little uh, about the uh, Furnish project. Um, the, the project, as itself uh, mentioned, um, it was generated by the um, as a response to the to the COVID-19. That uh, as a result, in uh, many problems that uh, existed in our cities, but in many cases were underrated, uh, have lately become uh, of utmost relevance. One of these are public spaces. Uh, we have rediscovered its, its value, uh, not only in preventing the spread of the virus, but also at no less importance for the value that outdoor activities uh, have taken as a result of the first confinement. Uh, all of us can say that. Uh, however, in many cities, the supply of these shared spaces is very low, generating overcrowding uh, with negative consequences by putting the health of the people at risk, uh, not guaranteeing that uh, the required social distancing can be maintained. In this context, cities uh, such as Milano, Barcelona, among others around the world, have already resorted to initiatives uh, that rely on tactical urbanism to reconfigure re uh, their streets and allocate them to pedestrians and community development. Furnish is based on this reality and six, the development of mobile uh, urban elements to be implemented and tested in public spaces. Uh, however, uh, we emphasize that furnish do not uh, simply intend to make urban furniture and place it uh, on a street. Our goal uh, goes further and we aim to reconfigure the urban spaces. To achieve this, a sequence of open collaboration workshops will take place uh, in which the Furnish partners as experts in urban design and temporary space design, local digital manufacturing and city management collectively uh, will mentor the group of the selected teams. So that all the knowledge generated from the design of the new uh, to the results obtained uh, from the interventions in the cities will rely on an open source repository uh, to be used and replicated worldwide, helping our cities to become uh, safe places capable of responding positively to the challenges that the new normal uh, brings uh, with it and become uh, better places to live. And now I'm going to do a bit introduction about who we are, the partners uh, that conform uh, this consortium, Furnish. Uh, in the first place, uh, Carnet is the future mobility research hub uh, init initiated by SEA, the Volkswagen Group Research, and the Polytechnical University of Catalonia. It's based in Barcelona. 
and is an open hub uh, for industrial and academic partners from the areas of automotive and mobility research and innovation. CARNET in this project will be uh, the responsible of the whole coordination. Uh, the city of Milan will share its multiple expertise in both uh, tactical and strategical urban design, especially their experiences during this pandemic, since they have paid a remarkable particular attention to common spaces under this emergency context. Together with Milan's Agency of Mobility, Environment and Territory, AMAT, Support, uh, the city will host the design of one of the selected teams in, into one of these of its collectively elaborated tactical squares. Uh, the Politecnical University of Catalonia, uh, based in Barcelona, is a public institution of research and higher education in the fields of engineering, architecture, sciences, and technology. The Department of Urbanism and Regional Planning, DUAT, uh, specializes in spatial planning and at, at the regional and urban level and architectural and public spaces design. It's involved in, this pro in project activities and business models and decision supports uh, tools in development. Uh, UPC will contribute to furnish with the, its expertise in the fields mentioned above. Uh, IAC, the Institute of, uh, for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, is an interdisciplinary research and education institution based in Barcelona as well. Between its expertise, uh, we can synthesize such topics as architecture, urbanism, innovation, participatory design, robotics, remote sensing, ecology, and digital fabrication, and information and communications technology. Also, IAC hosts the Fab Lab Barcelona, the leading node for, of the worldwide Fab Lab network. During this project, IAC will contribute with the, its wide expertise in local digital fabrication, as well as with its wide experience in hosting global collaborative and competitive uh, design events. And at last but not uh, less important, <laughs> Elisaba Barcelona School of Design and Engineering is a network of students, alumni, researchers, industry organizations, and cultural design stakeholders. Its expertise is articulated around a social, human, and cultural perspective on design, of design and engineering. Elisaba Research, a transdisciplinary uh, research group, investigates, ideates prototypes, and communicates current and, and future design, societal and business challenges. And Isaba will contribute in this project with its expertise in temporary space design, as well as in collaborative and co-creation platforms. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Angelica. Now, to, uh, to the city of Milan, Anamat, who is going to be presented by Rosella Ferorelli. Please, Rosella, when you want. Thank you, Ines. You're welcome. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here and to share uh, our experiences as a, a city in this very exciting consortium. Um, as one of the cities that have been uh, hit harder and probably uh, earlier by the pandemics in, in the world and in Italy for sure. Uh, Milan has, uh, has uh, let's say, collected a lot of, of thinkings, of thoughts about how to react to this kind of uh, emergency. And what we have learned in these very difficult months is that there are basically two approaches for such uh, uh, an emergency, such a uh, an exceptional uh, condition. Uh, in the very first phases of, uh, uh, of this kind of emergency, uh, the, all the cities in the world reacted more or less in the same way, uh, in a very, uh, with an approach of panic, 
of pulling back, uh, trying to defend the, uh, the, the territory from in fear, in, a, in an approach of fear. And all that was uh, basically uh, done were, were uh, passive defense tactics uh, with no the general uh, long-term scope that basically, um, let's say, forbid, for, forbidden um, every approach of public space uh, with the effect of contracting the existing rise to public space and, uh, let's say, uh, uh, replace a, a general open-minded approach to uh, public uh, realm uh, approach per capita in cities with a very strict uh, non-liberal, uh, anti-liberal approach uh, for the emergency. Uh, and uh, a very, I, I shared some uh, some pictures coming from very different uh, contexts in Europe, uh, where basically uh, the movement, the free movement of citizens in space, were uh, impeded. Um, and also, uh, one of the worst uh, consequences of this approach was, of course, the total surrender to uh, the private mobility. Uh, as the uh, very first approach to uh, avoid uh, the, uh, the, the, the gathering of a, a huge quantity of people in public uh, mobility, uh, in sustainable public mobility uh, transport, collective transport, let's say. Uh, and so a very uh, heavy burden on uh, urban mobility for the urban cities and Milan particularly which already had uh, strong pollution problems for uh, the excess of uh, private car use. But later in the second phase, we discovered that another approach, approach is possible, uh, a, a strategical active defense approach that pushed forward the uh, facing the crisis not as an opportunity, but as, let's say, uh, a, very, a very final advice from nature that a, a sort of active and uh, uh, aware uh, reaction is possible. So what we try to do is try to protect the existing right to public realm, expanding the public domain and promoting safe, active and sustainable individual mobility. Uh, this, uh, next, please. This translated in a set of, uh, um, uh, of new programs and uh, what we called uh, Milano Strategia di Adattamento, Strategy of Adaptation, uh, a set of, of rule and of occasion that the city created uh, open to uh, the open to citizen, but also uh, top down, both approaches to face the crisis. And what, uh, let's say, what, uh, what was collected in the end was a strategy to expand the public realm uh, by um, providing uh, a strong network of new uh, pop-up bike lanes uh, in, in, inside the city that uh, historically had uh, very uh, heavy luck of bike uh, uh, accessibility and uh, um, also relying on an already uh, existing approach that is the Piano Quartieri and Piazza Aperte well-known program um, that uses uh, tactical urbanism to regain the right to public space, uh, subtracting these spaces to a heavy car-oriented culture and, and give it, it back to, uh, to the people uh, as pedestrian and sustainable active mobility areas. Um, for this, uh, uh, we can share this already uh, ready uh, experience in, this, in the city that is trying to react to his own lack of public space culture. But what we still didn't do is working on new approaches to urban furniture. Uh, uh, until now, we still had uh, a very traditional approach to uh, the use of, of uh, urban furniture. And what we would really like to experiment in this uh, uh, emergency time is how to turn uh, the, the urban furniture uh, into an occasion for open source innovation and try to uh, open the even more the process to citizens and, uh, and young people.
Ines, we can hear you. You're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I was unmuted. I was saying thank you very much, Rosella. But uh, thank you very much, Rosella. Um, now we can move forward uh, to the represent uh, representative of UPC. Uh, his name is Juan Moreno, and he's going to talk about urban policies. Hi, Juan. Hi, Ines. Thank you very much. I'm Juan Moreno. I'm professor, a professor at the School of Architecture in Barcelona. And uh, from the UPC, uh, we, we look for uh, urban policies related to COVID-19 that are uh, identified as a priority you know, in different cities, especially in, in European cities. Uh, actually, urban planning tempos and planning issuing processes aren't synchronized uh, with the citizens' needs needs and much less when local administrations are in, in minimum services. So most of the urban policies are focused on providing emergency aids and urban design solutions are basically aimed at improving urban traffic or and restoring and increasing public space areas, uh, take, taking into account two basic premises, temporariness and economy. We think that with their proposals should consider high aims and the prototypes must be useful beyond coronavirus crisis. And in accordance with this, the goals that guide uh, the public urban policies in future are also the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda 2030 and in an international call for action led by the United Nations. The 17th SDGs are based on three basic goals that are end poverty, protect the planet and improve lives. In fact, urban policies and development strategies beyond COVID-19 health crisis should take notice of these uh, priorities also in industrialized countries. So we analyzed what kind of projects uh, being developed, developed in, in other uh, cities from a urban planning or urban design perspective, according to these uh, SDGs. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so we think that the, the main goals that are related to the EAT COVID-19 uh, call are first of all, uh, good health and well-being, ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being uh, at all ages in essential uh, to sustainable development by focusing on providing more efficient funding of health uh, systems, improved uh, sanitation and increased access to fishing physicians, but also fostering healthy social habits, such as playing sports or walking and reducing traffic impact in our urban environments. The second one is quality education. And uh, in 2020, a majority of countries announced uh, the temporary closure, closure of uh, schools, impacting more than 90% 90, 90 of the students worldwide. Never before have so many children been out of school at the same time and disrupting learning and appending lives, uh, especially the most vulnerable and marginalized. So the goal of, of this is, is to create physical and mental, and mental health spaces for children where safety and culture focus the proposal. The third one is reduce uh, inequalities and COVID-19 has uh, deepened existing inequalities, uh, hitting the poorest and most vulnerable communities the hardest. It has put a spotlight on economic inequalities and, and fragile social safety nets uh, that leave vulnerable communities to bear the brunt of the crisis. Refugees and migrants, migrants as well uh, as uh, native people, older persons, uh, people with disabilities and children are particularly at risk of being left behind. So urban proposals must be aimed at these vulnerable social groups. The next one is sustainable cities and communities. And then the, the aim is to provide uh, access to safe, accessible and sustainable transport systems for all, improving road safety, notably by expanding public transport with special attention to the needs of those in, in these groups in vulnerable, vulnerable situations. So we have to foster active mobility with uh, safety standards. The next is the responsible consumption and production. The, the, the aim is reducing waste generation through prevention, reduction, recycling, and reuse 
And so the proposals should foster circular economy, consumption of local food and recycling materials and, and producing energy. And finally, the, the climate action, that's why it's necessary to foster green economy and broadening green space in the urban environment and green economy that makes society more resilient. The strategies are focused on organic urban gardens or green walls that imply social maintenance. Uh, to sum up, there are our proposals about urban strategies according to and non to COVID crisis situation that get back to contemporary urban needs uh, from an economic and safe uh, vision, but based also in, in tactical urbanism. Thank you, Ines. Thank you very much, Juan. Now we are moving forward with uh, Elisaba. Uh, who is going to talk about temporality and the design approach generator. It's going to be presented by Rouge Bae. Please, Rouge. Thanks, Ines. Um, well, thank you all for uh, being here in this first introductory uh, session um, of the Furnish project. We're all very, very excited uh, to have you here and we're looking forward to your participation. We have a uh, consortium have been uh, working uh, intensively uh, to make this happen in the in the short time that we have to do so, so it's a very uh, it's a very uh, demanding but also very challenging and very exciting project that we will uh, be very happy to share with with you all. Uh, uh, basically, I would like to introduce two questions to to keep uh, uh, adding on to what my colleagues have been already um, exposing. The first one um, has to do with the relevance of temporality. That is, uh, if we are to achieve this expansion of public domain that we've been uh, speaking of, a uh, spatial design approach needs to be upgraded with a very close attention to, to temporality. Uh, and this for several reasons. Um, uh, but in any case, it is very, very important to understand that uh, our experience in public space, on the one hand, uh, happens in duration, so happens uh, over time. And also we need to be able to simultaneously do more than one thing in the same space. So um, how are we able to flexibly uh, uh, adapt to and react um, um, uh, and, and use different sort of uh, potential practices and potential uses in a limited public space uh, is a crucial question. Um, one of the things that we will uh, address in the, um, in the open innovation call that will start uh, soon after registration finishes um, are the, uh, uh, what can we learn from uh, what has happened in these past months during the COVID crisis? This that you're seeing now, these are four images uh, of um, situations that have happened. They're novel situations that have happened because of the pandemics. Uh, some of them are desirable, some of them are undesirable, but all of them need to be looked at in a critical way because they allow us to learn a lot from how uh, um, humans are able to adapt in these uh, difficult moments. And we can learn a lot as designers of these, uh, of these immediate responses. Um, we can talk about basically four kinds or four families of temporary urban responses to COVID-19 that we will be studying and hopefully, um, and hopefully um, using as a, as, a, as a platform for further in design. The first one has to do with biological life support. Um, the second one has to do with shared space support the third with the domestic space support, and finally uh, with uh, public space or, or what has been uh, now used as Christ, uh, uh, sorry, as a crowd uh, management uh, support. So again, we will learn from these experiences, many of which have to do with the initial uh, panic reaction that uh, Rosella was, uh, was uh, uh, referring to, uh, some of which have uh, been uh, distilled into more uh, uh, interesting and more uh, active strategic um, approaches. So in any case, it's obvious that we have uh, all learned a lot from the, uh, from, from, from the tension uh, that public space has had in these past months because of uh, uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And we want to critically learn from these examples and take them further to be able to one, address uh, the, the pandemic problem and also, as Joanne said, to understand that what we're doing for, uh, what we're thinking about now is not only a direct response to the pandemic, but it's something that we would like to stay in the way public space is uh, designed, managed and used. Mm, next one, please. So in order to do that, uh, one of the uh, things that, that uh, from we're offering or that we're asking 
uh, participants of this open innovation format is to uh, think through these uh, matrix of what we call expanded design approaches. The idea being that we would like to explore as much as possible uh, uh, the maximum variety, the maximum potential of these furnished projects. So that by the end of the selection process, which uh, will be explained later, um, we have uh, seven proposals that are as, as diverse, as rich, and as different um, as possible. So on the one hand, you need to take into account first on the left, you see the specific challenges, the urban challenges that cities have uh, and that have come, become very, very pressing issues uh, during the pandemic. So from uh, the use of creative industries, uh, schools and recre recreation areas, local commerce support, sports and leisure and uh, in urban areas and civic resilience. We will also deal with different urban situations. So if we're working in more polar spaces such as squares or more victorial spaces such as uh, streets and avenues or interstitial spaces. We also will think of different levels of temporality. So very, very short temporalities of barely hours or longer temporalities of uh, days and weeks. We can also think of different uh, spatial formats, different ways in which we can approach this very important question that Angelica raised in the beginning. We're not looking for furniture in the conventional sense of the term or not only. That is, we can work with autonomous objects. That would be an example of a conventional piece of furniture, but also of contingent objects. That is, objects that need um, other objects or the very built fabric in order to work. We can also think in terms of systems. We can think in terms also of generating atmospheres as spatial formats. Um, uh, then we have the performance that we're expecting from our design um, approaches, our, our, our prototypes that will be built and tested uh, on site. So these, these uh, prototypes can um, perform in very different or in different aspects. They can either uh, work uh, through a celebratory um, formats or maybe something that has to do with shared uh, rituals that are relatively uh, uh, common and daily. They can deal with activism and debate, self-care and self-sufficiency, or also prompt game uh, and chance uh, and chance logics. And finally, um, the fabrication uh, techniques, basically, that we can use, uh, they're, very, they're very varied and they're very uh, different. And we can, uh, we can really, we are looking forward to exploring different potential uses of both sectioning, tessellating, folding, contouring, forming, or other um, versions. So the idea of these matrix is just for you to understand that we're looking for a very open uh, approach that we will uh, creatively, I'm um, sorry, co-create uh, together, uh, the seven teams that finally get selected. Um, so the idea is that we all learn together, we all push our projects uh, together. Um, we try to uh, expand the possibilities of the furnished project as much as possible, because the final aim as was explained very clearly in the beginning, is to get to have an open uh, source uh, repository uh, for free use uh, uh, worldwide uh, proposals. So thanks a lot for uh, your attention and we're really looking forward to uh, having you on board. Thank you very much, Roger. We are going to move forward to Iax partner uh, who is going to talk about digital fabrication here, it's not well written. Uh, and it's going to be presented by Michael Salka. Please, Michael. Thank you, Ines, and thanks to the rest of the presenters. Um, my name is Michael Salka. I'm a project manager, coordinator, and tutor at the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia, as mentioned. Um, I wanna talk a bit very briefly about what digital fabrication means and then focus a bit more on why it's relevant to this furnished call and why it has a particular um, potential in light of COVID-19 and new challenges. Um, so essentially when we talk about digital fabrication, we're talking about using a workflow which use digital data to drive tooling equipment. Um, in its most basic sense, that involves creating a model of an object um, and then decomposing that model into fabrication files that inform the tool, uh, which eventually give us the physical geometry that can be assembled. Um, there are many different ways to produce these different varieties of files, uh, depending on the tool, just a few of the most common I've listed here, laser cutters, CNC, 3D printers, robots, and so forth. Um, but there are new tools every day. It's a very exciting genre. Um, and by combining different geometries and strategies with the most relevant tools, we can develop these different kinds of strategies for creating all sorts of forms um, that fill out that last 
tier of diversity in the rubric that Roger was discussing, um, the sectioning, contouring, tessellating, folding, and forming. Um, these are all different strategies depending on the materiality and the tool to achieve a design geometry. Uh, next slide, please, Ines. But what's really interesting to me about these digital fabrication strategies is their opportunity for societal change, um, not just to change how the way we make things, but how society goes about making things. Um, this is emblemized by the Fab Lab Network here, the map in the upper left. Uh, since a National Science Foundation grant in 2001 at MIT, um, so relatively recently, this network has expanded massively to include some 1500 Fab Labs across over 90 countries, um, all based on this concept of open source sharing of information uh, to allow prototypes and innovations that happen in individual labs to be expanded upon by other labs, creating a true knowledge community. Um, here in the lower left, this is the Fab Lab Barcelona that is housed by EAC. Um, and I think the Fab Lab Barcelona's most significant role, apart from all the great innovations done there, is acting as a leader among this network to try and ensure that this uh, community of exchanging knowledge and tools and innovation uh, continues to expand. Um, in light of COVID and the adaptation to public space, uh, there's this kind of transformation between the standard linear manufacturing model um, that can be disrupted with the application of digital technologies. Uh, because digital technologies are often small and operate cleanly using pre-processed materials with less waste, less offput of heat and gas and other toxins, um, they can be located directly within city centers. Um, that allows the collaboration of the consumers to become prosumers, to become co-designers in the solutions for their cities and their objects. And it also allows these people to become directly engaged in the manufacture. Um, the graphic here on the right is taken from the city of Paris's current initiative to implement a 15 minute city model, which is to say a city in which within a 15 minute radius of any neighborhood, you can access all of your basic needs, all of your schooling, your employment needs, healthcare, uh, leisure, so on and so forth. Um, this kind of model is also being implemented in pilots in Milan, as well as Melbourne um, and elsewhere. And of course, dates back much further than all that in urban theory to Jane Jacobs and the idea of cities not being just buildings, but also social networks. Um, of course, for this kind of model to work, and we very much want it to work because it has massive ramifications for the social coherence of cities, for having this connection within your neighborhood, um, of course, also for ecological impact of having fewer, shorter trips. Um, and obviously that's directly relevant to urban mobility as the EIT is uh, intending to progress it. Um, but for this to be feasible, we also need to be able to make and repair and innovate things, uh, whether objects or furniture or more complex urban interventions like we're discussing here in Furnish. We need to be able to make them, repair them and innovate them locally. Um, and these kind of Fab Labs or maker spaces, even if they're not formally part of the Fab Lab network, have a huge role in making this kind of tooling accessible to non-expert peoples um, and being able to locate them within proximity. Uh, and in that way, being able to have a direct feedback between the local need, the production, and the result. Um, and through that feedback, to be able to continually improve the designs of our objects and our spaces. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Michael. Well, uh, now we finish uh, with the uh, uh, presentation of all partners, and we want to have a brief moment for questions and answers. And we will ask you to ask what, what well, any questions you may have about the project and the call and how it's going to, to work. Before that, only to remember, everything is written on the website, and there are uh, there there are all rules where you can uh, check everything. But anything that you may like to uh, uh, to question, please let us know now, and we will try to do it. Only to remember, uh, the call is open till the 25th of September. Uh, we will announce the team, the selected team, on the 2nd of October. And on the 5th of October till the until the 15th of November, we are going to 
be designing and uh, produ producing, fabricating the prototype uh, in a, co -col in a co collaborative um, mentoring process. And uh, from, from the 15th to until the 13th of November, uh, we are going to test the prototypes in each city or each installation. More or less, this is the overall calendar. And now, if you have any question, I think that maybe they can write them or you can talk. How we can do it, Michael? What do you think? I think the best way to do it is to allow people to ask their questions with their microphones if they have access. Um, if you're in the audience, you can use the raise your hand feature, and then we'll know that you have a question waiting. Okay. Then please, if someone have has uh, have a question, raise your hand. Anyone? I I have a question. Do you hear me? Yeah. We do. So I'm from the uh, Alta Fab Lab in, in uh, Helsinki, Espo. Um, so we are building a team. And um, uh, the question is about the application form. So the main application form where you have the, describe the design approach, the design workflow, and uh, then allocate the roles and um, uh, specify the budget. So how do you see that? Um, happening and how do you plan to evaluate that based on the fact that you are not expecting like a clear uh, design idea uh, from the application? Yeah, um, well, I think that's about the design. Maybe Roger can talk about that and then I can talk about the workflow. Roger? Sure, um, the, um, about the design, um, we, we're not asking for, uh, for uh, let's say, yeah, we're not we're not basing our choice of uh, teams on on design for two reasons. The first one is that there's there's no time to to do that, and and we're very pressed uh, for time for uh, the reasons that uh, Excel explained explain, uh, in the beginning. And the second one is that it is important for us that each of the uh, selected teams will contribute to the overall uh, let's say uh, uh, process. That's why we're calling it a, an open uh, innovation format, and we're going to um, start with the um, with a series of, of mentoring, uh, let's say, uh, process where we will all uh, hopefully um, inform each other's projects to a, to a certain extent within the autonomy that each project has to have. So that's the reason why we are not asking um, for specific uh, projects or, or schematic projects. Uh, the second uh, the the second question that maybe maybe can help you or maybe I don't know whether that's exactly what you're asking for is uh, to go back to the uh, idea of this matrix that I uh, very briefly explained about and that you have also on the uh, on the website that is the our idea is that without you having to have a, a finalized project or a very clear idea on how you're going to uh, work or formalize your prototype uh, you at least have a strategic idea of what is it that you're interested in so that's why we're asking you to uh, simply um, fill or use this generator, this matrix that uh, I explained to help you uh, think and to hopefully help you think um, what is it that you want to propose. So first, for instance, what kind of specific um, urban challenge are you more interested in addressing? What uh, uh, level of temporality are you interested in addressing? Is it something that will react uh, as a matter of hours or matters of days or weeks? No? Uh, are you thinking in, ins in installing this prototype in, in, in relatively, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, polar spaces like central spaces or more um, vectorial spaces such as uh, streets? What specific performance are you expecting your prototype to have? What uh, uh, fabrication, uh, if not techniques, at least uh, general criteria are you trying to pursue? So the idea is not to have a final project because the, this is... Uh, Basically, as I said, you don't have time, and and then it 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 it, it beats the purpose of working uh, collaboratively and, and co-creating this process. But uh, at least we have an idea on what is the team, so how strong the team is that you're presenting on the one hand, and on the other hand, what are your strategic um, bets, if you will, or at least approaches. What is your criteria for working here? D does that make sense? And have I explained? Or yeah, that's, that's at least partially. Um, 
Yeah, that clarifies yeah. quite a lot. Um, so at least the design approach. Um, but then uh, about a budget. So um, I mean, like if, if you build this uh, working uh, designing approach uh, from the matrix and it's not, not nothing specific, then um, also the budget, it's uh, rather, um, so to build the budget, it's uh, so it's going to be not very accurate. So the way how I see it is that um, I could, uh, you know, approximately allocate time spent for each of the team members and then put the hours or translate the hours into, um, you know, monetize the hours into, like put them into numbers into the budget sheet. But uh, so uh, how, how we should go about that? Yeah, uh, I think that this is quite, you have to do, well, we are asking for a budget only to know that you uh, have a provision of what is coming, but we are not asking for after that invoices or something like that, okay? Then uh, um, you only have to make a provision of how you are going to use uh, the money. And as we already said, the hour are uh, 10,000 euros, but if you have more budget, you can use it, of course, but uh, we are only financing some kind of activities that I think that they are explaining the rules. And what we are asking for, it's a um, kind of first approach to the budget. It's not like the final budget. And the same with the, with the workflow, I, I, I would like to add that it's a kind, you have to present all members, all team members. Then the workflow needs to explain how everyone is going to participate in this co 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 well, collaborative design and, and um, fabrication. This is why you are going to use a workflow. And then it's a bit of matching workflow with your team members and workflow with your first idea of design approach. Okay, that, that makes it um, even more clear. Uh, so I, I have more questions, but maybe there are some other people who want to ask something. So I'm gonna uh, wait for a little bit. We do have a question here from Anna Svalle in the chat. I'm not sure if she has access to her microphone. Um, Anna, are you able to speak? Do you wanna voice your questions? If not, I'll read them out. Um, and it seems that the raise your hand feature is disabled. Apologies for that. So if you have a question, um, go ahead and post it in the chat. We'll make sure we address you. Uh, but Anna has asked two points. Firstly, simply who can apply? Do we have to be part of a registered entity? And then second for more explanation on the design approach based on the matrix for expanded design approaches. Um, Roger, you touched on this a bit already, but perhaps you can explain further. Um, yeah, um, uh, again, the idea of the, of the matrix is twofold. On the one hand, to make sure that, the, that we select, well, not we, the people that are responsible for selecting, the jury selects um, the uh, projects that are as varied and diverse as possible. That is, we're not interested in having, let's say, slight stylistic versions of the same uh, project. So we're interested in having different teams from across Europe both design and fabrication teams addressing different urban challenges in different kinds of spaces with different temporalities, with different fabrication techniques and different performances. So in this sense, uh, that is uh, the use that we will internally give to the generator. Okay, so if we're all addressing the same challenge and we're all addressing the same spaces and we're all addressing the same fabrication, uh, let's say, uh, um, technique, uh, then we will, we will not succeed in maximizing the possibilities of the furnished project as a whole. Uh, now, as far as as far as uh, uh, your interest as uh, participants or potential participants, the idea of the of the um, generator matrix is that it may help you to, without having to have a totally clear project in mind and without necessarily having still uh, a very uh, developed relationship with the municipality in which you're going to be uh, uh, hopefully building your prototype, but at least that it helps you to uh, ask yourselves a few basic questions, these five basic questions on the urban challenges, the kind of space you're working, the temporality you're, you're working with, etc., etc., um, in order to help you take design decisions or at least strategic design decisions. So it's not meant to be as um, 
it's, it's not meant to be a design guide because it's very open. It's meant to be a basic matrix that will help you hopefully to expand uh, your, uh, your strategic approaches or design approaches to this uh, idea of building prototypes uh, to expand public domain um, uh, during uh, COVID-19 crisis and beyond. I don't know whether it's uh, clear enough. Great. Um, Anna does not have access to her microphone. So I've also posted the support email address for Furnish in the chat for everybody. If your questions are not answered or we don't have time, you're welcome to send us an email there with any follow-up. Um, and then perhaps after Roger's great explanation of the matrix in that role, um, I can answer your first question, Anna, about who can apply or whether you have to be part of a registered entity. Um, when we say design entity, we're approaching that very broadly. This can be a sole proprietorship. If you're an individual, it can be a professional design firm. Um, it could be a research group within a university. What is critical is that your team comprises both a design entity and a fabrication facility. Um, we cannot accept applications from either designers who purely intend to outsource their fabrication or vice versa, even though that would be a more difficult application to make if you're a fabricator and you don't have a design intent. Um, because with the digital fabrication workflow and this idea of building these locally resilient fabrication communities, uh, the fabrication strategy needs to be implicit in the design, um, especially given the short timeline we have to realize this. Um, it needs to be something that's considered from the very beginning. Uh, for that reason, both of these parties need to collaborate in the team. Um, I think that also addresses a question from Bruno regarding the maximum number of team members. We don't have a fixed number. Um, what I would keep in mind is having those two criteria fulfilled and also having a logistically feasible number of team members, considering that both the collaborators need to participate in the co-creation process and it needs to happen within the timeline to be tested uh, during December. So a limited number of team members will help to facilitate communication. That being said, we also have a question from Javier Bono. Hello, Javier. Thanks for joining us. Can you voice your question? Yes, I, I would like that. I would like to know if it's necessary to, to inscribe all the people of the team or uh, that which is going to participate in during the process, or it's enough to inscribe the team leaders. Well, inside uh, the application, it's only for one person, but I mean, for one application, okay? There's no need to make it more than one. But inside the application form, you can include all team members. Okay, perfect, thank you. Javier, okay. I, uh, the idea would be that, uh, that is, we're not, uh, we're not taking to, into account how many people, uh, uh, teams have. So it's not a question of do you need more, do you need less. It's more a question of you explaining uh, what is your, your team and what is it comprised of. So if you have a team that's larger, that's welcome. If you have a team that's uh, smaller, that's also very welcome. Mm, my suggestion to you would be um, make sure that you address um, the, the specific roles you have in your team. So maybe a certain role can be a, a can be uh, occupied by one person or 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 or, or three. So um, it's really entirely up to you. How do you define and describe your team so that we at the distance can understand what kind of team you're proposing? It, it's very open, really. Okay. Thank you so yeah, much. Maybe to put that in slightly different terms, the the minimum number of team members you should list is the number that provides the expertise you need to complete your project. Um, additional team members beyond that will not be considered more favorably, um, but you can list them if they are involved. Okay, thank you. And I have another question. Uh, we are thinking about making a collaboration uh, in the part of design between two institutions, which are in, in different cities. One city is the, uh, one of the teams is in the, in the place uh, where the, the project is going to be developed. Another one is a uh, society, so it's from other university. Uh, is it possible, uh, because I have read that uh, the institution which is going to develop the design 
has to be uh, uh, from the same city that is going to be developed. Well, what is important is that you have clear where are you going to place your, your, your the element you are going to create. This is yeah. the most important thing. If, uh, well, I, we are supposing that if, for example, your institution is in, I don't know, Copenhagen, you are going to place it in Copenhagen, then you, yeah. are, you have to say to us where, uh, where you are going to place it, okay? If it's going to be uh, in the public space or it's going to be in, in the university, in the campus, wherever, it, uh, it's a place where people need, well, could, uh, could use it and um, where you, we are going to taste it. Okay, but uh, if someone from another institution is going, uh, is making part of the team, there's no problem, but you have to know exactly in which city you are going to play this. Okay, thank you so much. I don't have more questions. Thank you. Hi, uh, I, Inés and Roger and all, guy, all of you guys. Uh, I was looking at the application form and if you start trying to fill it, and add image for uh, the project as reference from the team. It seems short, the eight pages uh, application form. Uh, so there's some tolerance on these, or we need to follow these strictly, or we can change the formatting of the application form if needed. Well, I would say that it's better if you follow it because in terms of evaluating an, uh, an assessment will be easy, but in, I mean, in terms of giving always the same information, if you want to change something like the format, the form, I, there's no problem, but at least giving the information that it's asked for. Okay, thank you. Bruno, Bruno, I would, I, yeah. I, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a strange question, I think. That is, the, the, there is a format, uh, you should follow the format. Because if you don't follow the format, um, it, it may be very hard for people, uh, the external jurors that we have uh, invited uh, to uh, evaluate. Um, it may be much harder for them to uh, to assess it. Yeah, we yeah. have uh, X amount of teams, and everyone chooses their own format, which I, I see. Yeah, I, I, tot I totally agree with that. Uh, but I was struggling trying to to add all the information that you that you can add in, in, the, in the application form, mainly if you have more than five team members, all the, the CVs and all the, yeah. and if you have more than you five projects. You have to projects. shorten all of that, eh? because it, there's no much, much place. Then you have to be very short, very concise. I was and, reading uh, on, on, the, on the, uh, the, the characters with nine points to be shorter, <laughs> but I don't know. I'm changing format. I don't know if that's an issue or not a problem. No, you, you can change. If, I mean, if it's I keep format, structure. you can change I keep structure, it, but, but change please maintain the, all okay. the entries, you the know? Structure, okay. Okay, Thank the you. structure, please. And yeah. in, in about the previous project, don't need to be very long. I mean, only yeah. like title and whatever, you know? Okay. Thank you. Um, it, it's just yeah. a question of making sure that with the little uh, amount of space that we all have, you're able to convey uh, the, 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 the value of your team, the expertise of your team, and, and your basic uh, strategic interests. So okay. I, I would take the limitation of format as an opportunity to distill very precisely uh, all of these questions. Again, as Michael said before, the only crucial question as far as team is concerned is that there is one design uh, capacity, basically, and the fabrication capacity. Uh, you can have that with one person only, with two people, or with 2,000. It doesn't make any sense to 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 uh, have the two thousand uh, spelled out there. Maybe you just have the the, the principal team members. And again, uh, your previous expertise. Just make sure that you distill and you choose what you think is more relevant uh, given this call. Um, of course, I'm sure that uh, you you guys have done uh, all sorts of other things. But just uh, it just I would ask you all to take it as a as a challenge to uh, to really distill and address as as, as precisely as possible. What is it that, uh, what's the theme that you're presenting and what is it that you would like to do within Furnish? And in, indeed, uh, a couple of things of things more. Um, although you are, you are now like choosing some members, if after that someone else is coming, uh, there's not, well, it's going to be possible. I mean, if they, want, if they are 
participating in the design process and the fabrication, pro fa fabrication process, it will be okay. And the other thing is that think that all teams have the same the same space. I mean. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay, it's just a few minutes past six o'clock now. We can take maybe one final question. And then if there are any follow-ups, uh, you have the email address support at furnish.tech in the chat and feel free to write that with anything remaining. But to sign off, are there any last questions from the audience? There's a question again from, uh, from Chris Yanis. Maybe you want to address it, Michael? Yes. Um, okay, so Chris Yanis has asked here if the Budget available is only for materials or can be spent on services such as graphics, video production, website, et cetera. The budget should prioritize the materials and the physical realization of the prototype. Um, the 10,000 euro budget is fairly limited. And keep in mind that there is also time and funding within the Creator Furnish project for dissemination and also for the particular COVID-19 response call, the EIT will manage communication activities. Um, so your 10,000 budget should be focused on the realization in this time of the prototype and the testing. Um, the communication activities will be accounted for by the consortium. Okay, looks like we have one more call from Vicky. Hello, Vicky. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Vicky, do you have access to your microphone to say your question? Okay, I'll read it out for her. Um, she has a question regarding the structure of the application. In some sections, there is space to upload an image or a diagram. Are there any technical specifications regarding file size um, or so forth um, for uploaded images? I think as we were just discussing, um, please respect the structure of the application um, and fit your content within that structure um, and try to reduce as much as possible. Um, again, we're not asking for a fully developed design proposal, so you shouldn't require a great deal of graphic documentation. Um, yeah, so please reduce what you need to communicate to the application structure. You, you can, uh, you can uh, inter I mean, include images, but uh, the maximum size is 10 megas could be of the, I mean, of the file PDF. This is what you have to know. Right, 10 megabytes total for the combined package. Okay. Okay. Um, Francesca has one question. Let's make our last question because it's now five minutes past. Um, she's asked, will the design process be a full-time commitment? How long in terms of hours it will take? This is a difficult question to answer authoritatively. Um, the collaborative sessions will not be full-time. They will be at minimum once a week to maintain the pace of the development of the project, um, likely twice a week for a few hours each session. That will be the face-to-face the -face time between the seven selected design teams and the consortium. Um, how much time beyond those hours it takes to develop and fabricate and implement and test the project will be dependent on the design and the strategies. Um, so when you are applying and accepting responsibility to implement and test, uh, you are committing to the time you assess as necessary to complete these projects. Yeah, it, 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 it's very important that you understand that uh, during the mentoring process, uh, as said, maybe we're going to, you have to budget uh, as, as little as three and as much as six hours a week of uh, FaceTime basically which is important that we all have because we need to, uh, to communicate and to collaborate. Um, but obviously uh, you need to think that this is a rather intensive um, project because we are totally compelled. That's important to understand. We can't stress it enough. We're compelled by the very structure of the, uh, of, uh, of the, of, uh, the, of the EIT CRC um, that we need to uh, build the prototypes and test the prototypes on public space or something similar to public space. It could be uh, inside a uh, university campus or etc. Uh, within this calendar year. And also we cannot do that by Christmas because we also need before the end of 2020 to compile all the results of the prototypes tested 
uh, and we need to also compile everything that has to do with the uh, with the uh, uh, open source repository. So think that uh, October and November are extremely, uh, you, know, you will be very, very busy, I would say. But that, of course, as Michael said, depends totally on your strategy and your team organization. Okay. On that note um, okay. of enthusiasm and energy, maybe we can close questions. If there's anybody with remaining issues or concerns, please again, feel free to email at support at furnish.tech and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Well, only before finishing, I will give the, uh, the word to Angelica, who is going to close. Thank you, Ness. Um, well, just to close this introductory session, we would like to encourage everyone to send your proposals. We are very excited about this project. Uh, you will learn from the best. Ah, well, actually, all of us will learn from the best. And, but above all, um, the most important thing is that we will have fun doing what we love as we contribute to make our cities a uh, better place to live. So apply and we hope to see you soon. Don't forget that the call closes Okay, I think we've lost you. I think that we've yeah, lost Angelica. <laughs> well, okay. The important part is that please applications until the 25th of September. Um, well, we encourage you all to be with us. And hopefully we are going to have a great time and uh, improving our cities together. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Looking forward to, to hearing from you. Thank yeah, you very much. Need to work um, together. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.